This morning we are in Exodus chapter 18, Exodus chapter 18, and we are picking up our study in the book of Exodus in chapter 18 and verse 13. We will be coming to the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai here starting next week, but we got to wrap up Exodus chapter 18, and uh, my goal this morning is to cover verses 13 through 27. For those of you who are new, we've been kind of walking through Exodus Um, And we've been going with the Israelites as they've been set free from Pharaoh and Egypt and taskmasters. And now they are in the wilderness. And um, and so we're picking it up now. This is my idea this morning. And this is like a common theme that I really believe in. I really deeply believe that God is calling every man, woman and child to belong to a healthy church community. I really believe that. That's not just me being a preacher, pastor, saying what he's supposed to say. I believe that God himself, not me, not some church, not some priest, not some pope, not some religion or denomination. I believe God himself is calling every man, woman, and child in the world to belong to a healthy church community. Now, there's two parts to that. The first part is the call that you are responsible for. So that means that I believe that if you're a human being created in the image of God, you are, you are made specifically to be in a church community. I believe that. That's your responsibility. That's for you to deal with God, and that's between you and God. That's not me. That's you and God. you got to deal with that. But the second part of that statement is that churches are responsible to be healthy. So this is not just about people's responsibility to go to church. This is about church's responsibility to be healthy. And that's on us as the church. We have to work at being healthy as a church community. Health, like anything else, like in in my life or in your life or in your marriage or in your relationships or at your job, health is not something that happens accidentally. Health is something that happens intentionally. And what God is calling us to be as a church is to be a healthy church community so that when we say to people, you need to belong to a church, we can honestly say we are a healthy church. Now note that I am saying health. Everybody say health. I am not saying perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect church community. And we would be the first to stand in line to say we are not a perfect church community. But just because we can't be perfect, that doesn't mean that we can't be healthy. Just because I can't be a perfect husband, that doesn't mean I can't be a healthy husband. Just because I can't be a perfect friend, doesn't mean I can't be a healthy friend. God calls us to health. God has provided for us to be healthy. And to be a healthy church community that every man, woman, and child can belong to, a church needs two broad things going for it. Let me give you those two things really quick, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the second one, but I'm going to give you the first one just because I want to. Can I get an amen? For a church to be healthy, first of all, a church has to have a converted membership. A church community must be composed of members who are genuinely born again in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without that, health is not possible. Because what gives us the right to be in God's community as a church is not our religious performance, but Jesus saving us as sinners. What gives me a right to be a member in a church is that I am a sinner saved by grace. (laughs) I am a man who stood before a holy God perfectly dirty, totally full of iniquity, And the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see that Jesus purchased my salvation with his blood. And as a result of my believing in Jesus Christ spiritually, I was baptized into the body of Christ. And I get to practice that locally and visibly in my local church. You're like, why is that important to a healthy church community? Because when you go into a church community, you are full of diversity. There are a lot of different people walking around here this morning. You got people with money, you got people without money. 
You got people who are extroverted. You got people who are introverted. You got people who like to run and people who like to walk really slow. Can I get an amen? And when you have a lot of diversity in a community, you need something that connects you in common. And what connects us in common as a church is that we are sinners saved by grace. And that means I can't look at you and say, why do you walk so slow? Walk fast like me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That gives me patience with you. And I need you to be patient with me. Because I am far from perfect. I know that surprises you. The only way you can have a healthy church community is when you have a bunch of people who say, man, I am humbled by the fact that Jesus had to die for me on the cross. I am humbled by the fact that in order for me to be right with God, I had to be forgiven because of the work of Jesus. And yet I need confidence to walk in community. I need to know that God loves me. In other words, I need confident humility. And the only thing that can give a human being confidence and humility simultaneously is the great work of the person and work of Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace. What does the gospel do to a community? You know what it does? It gives people thick skin and a tender heart. I have thick skin because I'm saved by God. I have thick skin because I'm reconciled to God. I have thick skin. So you could say to me, I don't like your preaching very much. And I could say, I'm okay with that for the most part. (laughs) Like my self-esteem does not come from what you think of me. My self-esteem comes from the righteousness that I've been given by Jesus. And I'm going to walk in this community and sometimes you're going to let me down and sometimes you're going to say something to me that hurts my feelings. Sometimes you're going to say something or do something that really gets me worked up. And what I got to do is remember, hey man, the reason why I'm a part of this community is not because of what you say about me, but what God says about me. And God says I'm loved. The only way we can be a healthy church community is if we are sinners saved by grace. The moment we are self-righteous or we think we are more deserving than other people of salvation is the moment that we begin to divide and crumble. But if we are sinners saved by grace together in community, we can be healthy. So what do you need to be a healthy church community? You need a membership that believes in the gospel of God's grace through Jesus Christ. But that's not even what my sermon's about. You're like, what? I saw that, Wayne. (laughs) Wayne doesn't think I have peripheral vision. He's like, when pastor's looking that way, I'm going to look at my watch. I'm just joking with Wayne. Wayne and I have such a good relationship. We can mess with each other. To be a healthy church community, you not only need a converted membership, you need healthy leadership. Without healthy leadership in a church, you cannot be a healthy church community. No matter how well-meaning the people are, no matter how well-meaning the members are, without healthy leadership, you cannot be a healthy church community. And so when we come to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 18, we have one of the greatest passages on church leadership ever. We come to a place in Exodus chapter 18 and we remember where the Israelites have been. They've been in slavery. They've been set free. But as we've talked about, even though they've been set free, they've got to learn how to live free. So it's one thing to be set free by the blood of the lamb. It's another thing to live free in the power of the gospel in Jesus. You know, it's kind of like if you're a prisoner and you've been in prison for, you know, 400 years and suddenly you get let out of prison, you got to take off those prison clothes and put on new clothes, and then you got to reorient your life to a life that's not a life of slavery. That takes time. And the Israelites are really struggling with their freedom. Yeah, they're no longer under Pharaoh. They're no longer under the taskmaster's whip. But they're struggling with their own attitudes. They're struggling with their own flesh. They're struggling with their own weaknesses in the wilderness. And so, not only do they have to fix their complaining, not only do they have to 
lean on the spirit and not on the flesh, but the other thing that they've got to do in order to survive the wilderness as God's community is they've got to develop their leadership. And so we pick it up and we read the critical passage on spiritual leadership and church leadership in Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 and following. Here's what it says. Let me get my glasses out. It says, the next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice, and I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. You shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure. And all this people also will go to their place in peace. Now we see this, this passage Jethro's advice to Moses. And we see what it's about. Moses is not leading correctly. Moses is, is practicing unhealthy leadership. And Jethro, at that critical moment, says, what you are doing is not good. You're bottlenecking all this ministry. You're doing all this extra work. And the problem with Moses' leadership structure is not only is it not good for him, but Jethro says it's not good for the people. He says that the people cannot endure with the way that Moses is leading. And then he gives him a plan for a way of leadership, and he says if Moses follows this new plan of leadership, verse 23, if you do this, God will direct you you will be able to endure, and this people also will go to their place in peace. Now, beloved, I know it's hot in this room right now. How many of y'all are hot right now? All right, now I'm telling you, you can't fall asleep on me. Now, I'll tell you why. This is one of the most important passages on leadership in all the Bible. In fact, the rest of the Bible maps onto this passage new textures of understanding of spiritual leadership. And some of you have been hurt by churches. How many of y'all have been hurt by churches before? Look at that. That's a lot of hands. How many of you guys, it's, it's hard to trust churches? It is. And there's a lot of damage going on in churches. And one of the reasons why there's a lot of damage in churches is because of bad, faulty, unhealthy leadership. Well-meaning, good-intentioned churches end up hurting people because of bad unhealthy leadership. And this passage tells us what a church needs in order to have healthy church leadership. Let me tell you what a church needs. First of all, a church needs a structure of plurality. A structure of plurality. We see this especially when Jethro says in uh, verses 17 and following, Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. 
Now obey my voice and give advice. Then he says in verse 21, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. This is critical. What's he saying? He says, you, in order to be God's community in a wilderness, in order for you to be God's healthy community in a wasteland of a world, you have to have a structure of plurality. In other words, a church cannot be led by one person. A church cannot be led by a personality. A church cannot be dependent upon a pastor. A church community must have a plurality of leadership. This idea is pointed out in the New Testament in the in many places, I'm just going to go to one place because i got a lot of passages today. But let me just read to you one passage in the New Testament where the church is organized. And Paul tells these early churches to organize themselves around a plurality of leaders. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, where Titus says, This is why I left you in Crete. So Paul is, uh, Paul is telling Titus, a young pastor, how to organize the church. And he's saying in verse 5, this is why I left you, Titus, in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Note what Paul is telling Titus to do. Who is Titus? Titus is a pastor. Titus is a preacher. Titus does or did what I'm doing this morning. He's preaching with all of his heart. And they didn't even have AC. Can I get an amen? And he's preaching and preaching and preaching and trying to tell people to believe in Jesus and to know the Bible and to get together and to be together in life groups and to pray together and to be in fellowship. Titus is working his tail off. And Paul is telling Titus, listen, when you go around to these towns and you plant churches, the first thing you need to do is start finding some other dudes to be elders in the church because you cannot do this alone. You need a plurality of leaders who will help you shepherd the church. That's a structure of plurality. It's elders. Jesus showed this idea of plurality. Did Jesus send his disciples out by themselves? He sent them two by two, didn't he? He's like, when you go out and you evangelize, I don't want you to go by yourself. I want you to go with somebody else. And when Jesus formed his disciples, he came up with 12 disciples. And then within that discipleship, there were three primary leaders within that that group of 12, Peter, James, and John. And then among those three, there was Peter, who was kind of a first among equals because he was the loud mouth in the group. Can I get a praise? And Peter was the leader of influence, a first among equals, but Peter had no more authority than James or John or the other apostles. Because Jesus says, when you go out and you begin to build the church, I want you to have in your mind that you need a plurality of leaders. The only way a church can be healthy is with a structure of strong plurality. Strong plurality. And why is this? Why is it that you have to have plurality of leaders in a church in order to be a healthy church community? Well, for the same reasons that Jethro brings up to Moses. It's a bunch of limitations. Everybody say limitations. That's right. We are all limited. What are our limitations? Number one, we have a limitation of time. This transfers over into everybody's life this morning. Did you know that you are limited on your time. You can't do everything that needs to be done. You need somebody else to do some of the other things. And what happens is, is that leaders in particular, we get egos and we think we can do it all, like Moses. And we can't. We are limited with our time. Not only are we limited with our time, we are limited in our talents. 
I only have half a spiritual gift. Can I get an amen? And that's it. I'm not a very talented guy. And you know what? You're probably not as talented as you think either. Do you have talents and gifts from God? Absolutely. But do you have enough talents and gifts to do everything that needs to be done? Absolutely not. You need other people who are strong in areas where you are weak so that you can get God's job done together in community. We are limited in our time. We are limited in our talents. And then finally, we are limited in our nature. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we are sinners. Moses is a sinner. Paul was a sinner. Titus was a sinner. Timothy was a sinner. The most godly person you know has a sinful nature. And the only way sinful, natured leaders can make it around this world without falling completely down is if there is a plurality of leaders around that leader to hold them accountable. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We need a structure of leadership. That baby is driving me crazy because that baby's making pooping noises. Praise God. I'm trying to speak through the pooping noises. What do we need to be a healthy church community? We need a structure of health. The second thing we need is we need men of godly ability. Not only do we need plurality of leaders, we need godly leaders of ability. We see this in Exodus chapter 18 where Moses clearly says this. He says in verse 21, Jethro says, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Moses does this. Look at verse 24. It says, So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Jethro's telling Moses, you need to find able men, but he defines ability, and this is very important. He defines ability. And what is the ability for a healthy church community of men that are chosen? Not just their talents, but their spiritual life. Leaders must fear God. They must be trustworthy. They must hate a bribe. Oftentimes, churches choose only talented men to be leaders in the church. They don't consider the spiritual side of a man to be leaders. In the New Testament, again, the New Testament layers onto these, this passage from Exodus 18 and gives us che- texture and gives us understanding of what men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, look like. Let me give you a couple examples from the New Testament. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 2, the early church is trying to get going in its mission. And in its mission, the church is uh, running out of, of ability to take care of everybody. And in Acts chapter 6, some widows are getting overlooked and neglected in the daily distribution of food. Widows were dependent in the church upon food being given to them so that they could have food. And they're getting overlooked by the church. And so, of course, everybody's upset about this. And, you know, there's a big uproar and everybody's all upset because the widows are getting overlooked. And so it says here in Acts chapter 6 verse 2, Acts chapter 6 verse 2, Do I have that slide? Acts chapter 6, verse 2. It's a funky day today. 
Acts chapter 6, verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Note what they do. It's the same thing that Moses had a problem with. There wasn't enough people, so they had to start delegating to people. But they didn't just delegate to warm bodies. They weren't just like, well, whoever can get the job done, just get them in there. They were like, man, we got to pick people who have a good reputation, who are full of the Spirit, who have wisdom in their life. These are the ones who are to be our leaders, who make sure that things are being taken care of. This, of course, is important that we have godly men who are taking care of things so that those who are responsible for the preaching of the word and evangelism can focus on prayer and word ministry. I can say as a pastor, that is absolutely essential for my own ministry, for sure. Again, to give you another example of this idea, how do we be a church of a healthy church community, man, you got to have godly men of ability. Not only do you need a structure of plurality, but that plurality has to be full of men of godly ability. First Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 and following, listen to the qualifications for an elder or an overseer of the church. <clears throat> and I burden you with these passages, and I burden myself with these passages, because many churches could care less. I mean, many, literally, many churches could care less about the quality of the spiritual life of their leaders. We have to care about these qualifications. We are not in the dark about who should be leaders. 1 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 and following. It says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble, noble task. That word overseer is synonymous with pastor, elder. Um, this is the office of elders and pastors. Verse 2, therefore an overseer must be above reproach. That's kind of your catch-all qualification of a man who is a leader in the office of elder or pastor. He should be above reproach. You ask, well, what does above reproach really mean? It goes on to say he should be the husband of one wife. You're like, well, that's pretty easy, but actually the text in the Greek really is talking about a, a leader who has eyes only for his wife. He's not a man who is flirtatious or a man who has an eye for other women. He clearly only has eyes for his wife. He should be the husband of one wife. He should be sober-minded. He should be self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. In other words, he should know the doctrine of Christianity. If somebody were to ask him questions about what the Bible says about certain subjects, he might not know every answer, but... Overall, he could teach somebody the basic doctrines of Christianity and the Bible. He's able to teach. <clears throat> He's not a drunkard. Church leaders have no business going off and drinking scotch and getting a little buzz in the name of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? It's just not a good idea. I know church leaders that do these things. Yeah, man, we get together, smoke some cigars. Have a little scotch, tip it back, get a little buzz going. It's like, look, man, that might be good for some dudes, but if you're a church leader, 
no more. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah? You don't want Pastor Josh getting a buzz. Come on. <laughs> Verse 3, not a drunkard. He's not violent, but gentle. That's hard. Well, sometimes, I mean, we dudes, you know, we pastors, we're red-blooded men too, man. We want to fight. Some people say things, they're like, come on, let's go. It's like, no, man, you can't do that anymore, man. You, you got to be gentle. You can't be quarrelsome. You can't be quarrelsome. You can't have church leaders looking for a fight. Always looking for a fight. Got to be humble, patient, speak good things into people's lives, not trying to push people's buttons. Men like to do that. Men like to push each other's buttons. We get quarrelsome. It's like elders can't be like that. Pastors can't be like that. Pastors and elders and church leaders cannot be lovers of money, it says in verse 3. We see what happens to pastors and preachers who love money. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they love money. They're asking for offerings for a different reason than biblical reasons. They want to get their wives Ferraris. Can I get a praise? I said, Sherry, baby, you want a Jaguar or a Ferrari? She's like, stay humble. You can't have pastors who love money. You can't have elders who love money. You can't have deacons who love money. Obviously, they can have money, but the money should not have them. There's nothing wrong with a pastor being provided for, by the way. There's nothing wrong with spiritual leaders being well-to-do. But the question is, does money own the leader? Because if money owns the leader, then the Holy Spirit doesn't own the leader. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't own the leader, then the church is in, is in trouble. <clears throat> Verse 4, he must manage his own household well. With all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Yeah. I mean, children in the way that they come up, that is kind of a sign of the way that a man manages his house. It's not that, that the children have to be Christians, but it certainly should be that the children are raised in such a way to where they understand respect. They're not crazy. You got to manage your own household well. You got to you got to manage the finances well. You got to be good with money. You got to be good with your kids. You got to be good with your wife. You got to be good with how you treat other women. You got to be good with how you treat your enemies. You got to forgive your enemies and be able to pray without punching your enemies in the face. This takes some sanctification. Can I get a hallelujah? It's taken me years. And there are days when I might get disqualified by the Holy Spirit's grace, I don't. He says in verse 5, For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? What a great question. If you can't run your house, why am I going to put you in a role of leadership in the church? That doesn't make any sense. Well, because, he, because he's a CEO. It's like, so? He must not be a recent convert. Boy, that's important. Or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. You know, men, I mean, we men, when we first become Christians, we think we can do everything. We're just like, oh, man, I'm the guy. I can do it. I can preach. I can lead. I, I've got this. And it's like men typically need seasons of being humbled and growing and developing and then finally in verse 7, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. You know, the question for a church leader in the church is how is the church leader seen outside of the church? What does his neighbors think of him? His co-workers think of him? What do people outside of the church think of this person? What do unbelievers think of this person who is a leader in the church? Now, can I say, it's like I'm taking a lot of time to walk through this, but I just want you to know that as a church, first of all, I believe that our church leadership are of men of this caliber. Can I get an amen? 
and you need to pray for me and your leaders that we will continue to be humble before God and continue to grow and not disqualify ourselves because you can have these characteristics and easily lose them because of temptation, because of sin in the world. But also, I mention these verses because as we move forward as a church, as we begin to think about spiritual leadership, these are the kind of men that we are looking for. And no, I am not being accidental in my gender associations. I do believe that it is men who should be elders. I think that's clear from Scripture. I think it's men who should be pastors. Churches are compromising on this as well for the first time in 2,000 years. Suddenly, churches think that somehow these texts have changed. They have not. It is men we want. It is men we need. It is men who are humble and confident in the gospel that we are seeking. And for those of you who are brand new Christians and you're young in your faith as a young man or as a man in general, I want you to know that these qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 are not speaking of elite men in the church. These are characteristics that Jesus works in every man that gives him their life. This is what a man looks like as Jesus shapes him, as Jesus works in his life. And it might be that you're never an elder or a leader in the church, but I promise you that that God is wanting to do these things in your life, guys. And women, you should pray for men to have these characteristics. I know that some of you women have been affected by feminism and all kinds of ideology where, you know, somehow you think men are the bad guys and somehow that that men are the, the reason for all the problems in the world. I promise you, women and men have done plenty of jacking up of the world. Can I get an amen? So what you should do as women is you should pray that men should become this type of guy, this portrait from 1 Timothy chapter 3. What a wonderful community we would have, not only in our church, but in Kenosha and Pleasant Prairie, if more men had only eyes for their wives. What a wonderful church and community we could have if we had men who were respectable and self-controlled, who used their strength not to run over people, but to serve people. What a wonderful community and church we could have if men were not drunkards. They left the taverns and the neighborhood bars and they started going to church and worshiping their Creator. What a wonderful, wonderful community of church we could have and in our communities if we had men who really worked on managing their household well and putting their family before their popularity or their status. What a wonderful, wonderful community we could have if we had men who when they are newly converted are humble enough to take a season and just to learn at the feet of Jesus and His Word. This is a vision for masculinity that is beautiful. And there's a reason why our churches in America are composed of like 70% women and 30% men. You want to know why? Because we don't read these passages to men anymore. We don't look at guys and say, listen, I want to come alongside of you and encourage you and challenge you at the same time because every man needs to be encouraged and every man needs to be challenged and needs to be accountable. And we could be that church, man. We could be a church where men are growing in Christ. But in order to have men who are growing in Christ, we need leaders who are shaped by Christ. We need godly Godly men in leadership. If we're going to be a healthy church, if we're going to be a healthy church, we've got to have a structure of plurality, but we've got to have men of godly ability. And the final thing, and then I'll be done, is that when we come back to the Exodus passage, we find a third thing that leads to a healthy leadership community in the church. And that is that the goal, the goal of leadership in the church should be biblical maturity for the community. In other words, you need a plurality of leaders, men, 
who are shaped by those characteristics of 1 Timothy 3. And then their heart for the community should be that people are growing in biblical maturity. That the mission of the church should be biblical maturity. We see this clearly both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. First, Jethro, he says in verse 18 of Exodus 18, You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice. God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way, the way in which they must walk and what they must do. You see that in verse 20? Moses, you are to make sure that they know the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Now, this is all preparation for the Ten Commandments because what's going to happen is, is Moses is going to go up on Mount Sinai, he's going to get the law of God, and he's going to bring that law down to the people on two tablets of stone. And God is going to move the people from depending upon miracles to depending upon his word. So they've moved from signs and wonders of God through Moses where God's delivered them through plagues and the sea is split and all these signs and wonders have happened. And now God's moving them to maturity where they're no longer dependent upon signs and wonders, but they're dependent upon the Word of God. That is the flow of Scripture from miracle to the Word. What is the goal of a spiritual leadership in the church. It is biblical maturity that the community of purchased, blood-bought people is that they would grow in the understanding of the Word of God. We see this a time and time again, obviously, in the New Testament as well. We saw there in Acts chapter 6, in verse 4, when they're picking out the deacons, Stephen and those guys, and the apostles say in verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Why is it that you need the the widows to be well fed and taken care of so that the ministry of the word can continue and can, can grow through the teaching and the spreading of the word? So many other passages too, too many to count, but we see that this is the goal. You're like, what should the goal of the church be? Well, the goal of the church should be to grow in Scripture, to grow in biblical maturity. It's not to have a good experience or a rock show or some performance or, you know, rock climbing walls for everybody. No, the goal of our community is to grow in the Word from the youngest of us to the oldest of us. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and following. Listen to these verses. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. There's the foundational leaders of the early church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Why did God give these shepherds and teachers? To equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Man, look at verse 14, beloved. Look at this, guys. Look at this. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Do you know how much deceitful lies we are being told out in culture every single day? It's like waves. And we're like children bobbing up and down like a cork on the ocean. 
You know, we're just bobbing around on the waves of deceitful schemes, and we're so easily led by lies. And what we got to do is come to church and say, I am purchased by Jesus, and I'm going to start replacing lies with the truth, and the truth I'm going to replace the lies with is the Word of God. And we need godly men who are saying, that's what we do. And there are other churches that are like, oh, we're going to go and bless Kenosha and bless the city. We are a church in the city for the city, for the city of the city of the city of the city. And we are going to make Kenosha a better place. It's like, no, what we are going to do is teach people the word of God. Thank you. I thought it was funny as well. <clears throat> we are going to teach people the word of God. Think about 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 13 through 16, where Paul tells Timothy, a young pastor, his job as a leader, he says, until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourselves in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. What is the job of a pastor? It is to keep a close watch on himself and on his teaching. But as one final example, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following. How do we have a healthy church community? We need healthy leaders, and we need the goal of our church, where we're leading people, is to biblical maturity. Come hell or high water, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following. <clears throat> <clears throat> where Paul charges Timothy. Paul is nearly dead when he writes this. He's about to get his head chopped off by Nero. And these are some of his last words that he, he wrote right before he died. That's how solemn and serious these words are. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word... Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's healthy leadership. Healthy leadership is not about being successful. Healthy leadership is not about being the biggest, the baddest, the most popular. Healthy church leadership is about being significant and fruitful the way that God has determined. Healthy leaders want to follow God even in the wilderness. How many leaders would have led Israel the way God led Israel in the wilderness? How many CEOs would have been like, you know, we could either go straight north into the promised land or we'd go straight out into the wilderness and back us up against the Red Sea and almost get killed by Pharaoh and all his army? How many CEOs like, let's do the Red Sea plan? No, that's what God did. And Moses was listening to God. We need wise leaders. You've got to have a church of leadership that's like listen we will follow god in season and out of season now how do you apply this to your life well number one i believe listen let me tell you i believe that every man woman and child is called to belong to a healthy church community but i also believe that a church is responsible to be healthy how do you have health in a church you have healthy leadership. In Tabernacle, we have all the potential in the world to be healthy in our leadership. You've got healthy leaders right now. 
I'm proud of our leaders. We've got leaders who love you and serve you, who serve this church. But we as a leadership, we've talked about, we're reading books about how we're going to move forward with our structure and how we're going to do leadership moving forward. But we're also praying for future leaders because we're going to need some leaders in the years to come to step up. you got to pray for those men. Some of you are in here, you don't even know that you're a future leader of this church. But God is calling you. Ladies, you got to pray for godly men. Not perfect men, none of us are. But humble men before God. And I'm just going to say this because it's just been on my heart. And I'm going to close with this, and I'm almost done. I know it's hot. I'm sweating. Are you sweating? I'm sweating. Are you good? Can I talk for three more minutes? All right. If you said yes, you can stay. You can come back next week. In a couple of meetings and a couple of conversations, people have seemed kind of panicked about the state of men. We need godly men. Our men need to get godly. <clears throat> Our men need to... We need to do something. We need to, we need to do something to help our men. And I'm not in disagreement with that, but can I tell you guys, and I'm going to tell the ladies this as well, the most important thing that we do as men is we get to the ordinary channels of God's grace. You know where men grow up in Christ? Right here. The ordinary channels for us to grow as men and women is coming to church to hear the Word of God. It's joining in life groups and praying with other men and other women. It's praying and serving in ministries in the church. Do you know that the church community is still God's sufficient means for all of us to grow up in Christ? We don't need an extra retreat or an extra conference or an extra bonfire that we sit around and we start crying together. We don't need any of that to grow in Christ. All we need is the church. And it's not that you can't go on an extra retreat or a conference, but I'm telling you, men and women, we are here every week opening up the Bible. And we are giving each other and feeding on the Word of God. And if you join us in this journey of learning the Bible with us as we focus on Jesus and His grace for us, I promise you the Holy Spirit will do extraordinary things through the ordinary means of just being together as His church. And all men need is men just need prayer, encouragement, and sometimes a little pat on the rear in that kind of dude way. You know what I'm saying. Not ladies patting on the rear. Wow, I just talked about godly leadership, and I don't know if that was godly. A, a chest bump. A, that's what I'm looking for. Every now and then, a dude sees a chest bump. Like, come on, dude. Step up, man. Clean it up. Be accountable. Grow up. Receive God's love. Be changed. And don't let ladies slap you on the rear. Can I get an Amen. That's probably a sign I need to finish this sermon. It's been a very long day, but God's word will not return to me void. Can I get a praise? Pray for your church. Pray for your leaders. And men, seek God as he leads you. We need godly men in this culture. And I'm happy to focus on men today. I really am. I love you guys. And I need your encouragement and challenge. I need you to hold me accountable. We need each other. Let us pray.